good morning. We are glad that some of you are here. I know it's the end of the year, but man, we're, we're still here to worship together. Why don't you stand up with us as we get started this morning? This morning, we're glad that you're here. Welcome to Northeast. Uh, if you grabbed a program on your way in this morning, just a few things on there for you to note. One, today's the last day of the year. Anybody excited about that? Bring on next year. It's it's still going to be just as weird as this last year was. Just take you three months to get used to writing the eight instead of the seven. Um, if uh, like I said, if you grabbed a program, just a couple things for you. If you have kids, uh, even if you don't have kids, I'm. I'd I just decided to throw this out there just for everybody for fun. Uh, next week, uh, we're starting a new thing uh, throughout 2018. Uh, just once, I believe, every single month, we're going to have something fun for the kids uh, to be able to do something for them to look forward to and get excited about. Next week starts that fun. It's PJs and Pop-Tarts. So all the kids get to come dressed in their PJs. And if you're a parent and you're like, you know what? I want to be lazy. I don't wear PJs at church. You can do it. That's okay. Maybe we'll get extra Pop-Tarts for you guys, too, just for fun. Um, and then uh, following uh, next Sunday on Monday uh, is a, a Get Air at the Silo family event. If you have kids you want to come, parents jump for free on Mondays, so that's a pretty exciting thing. But, uh, again, we uh, we want to try and do some fun stuff together as families this upcoming year. And So if you're free and available, we'd love for you to come uh, to that. Uh, Seth is out on vacation this week. This morning we have Larry Leatherman from uh, Clifton Christian Church here to uh, to bring the word. And uh, so we um, hope that you'll be blessed by that this morning. 
And then next week, uh, Seth will be back and we'll be starting a brand new uh, sermon series, a brand new marriage series called Improving Ours. Uh, Whether you have a great, strong, healthy marriage or some difficult things that are going on or you're just somewhere in the middle, uh, there's lots of stuff uh, in God's Word that can help us through uh, through marriage in the way that God intended it. And so we, you know, we invite you to come and, and to bring your spouse uh, as we do that together. Why don't you turn around and, and tell somebody a New Year's resolution that you have this morning? Yeah, we've been bringing her 45 years now. this morning.
close out the Christmas season, I want to talk about possibly the greatest gift that's ever been given, easily the greatest gift that's ever been given to us, and that's that our Savior died of a broken heart for us. Quite literally, he both physically and spiritually died of a broken heart. See, when Pilate sent Jesus down to see the soldiers, they used a whip that was terrible. We've heard it described. It, it not only tore at the flesh on the outside, but it literally caused internal damage Jesus was bleeding out internally and externally. It's called hypovolemic shock. It's where the body draws all the blood up to the heart in an effort to save it. So it takes it from non-essential areas to essential to feed the organs that need to stay alive. And likewise, pulls all the moisture up to the heart to protect the heart because it's working so hard. And so the body literally dehydrates. It's, medically speaking, one of the worst, most terrible, painful ways to die. And this is what our Savior died. And in this process, as his body is doing this, we know that all this water is around his heart because he gets pierced in the side and water and blood come out. He didn't get pierced in the heart. He was pierced in the side. And as that water poured out, along with it was blood, there was none left in his heart because it had pumped so hard, it literally pumped out the very last drop and broke, and he died. He died of a broken heart for us physically. Spiritually, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about how the world from the sixth hour to the ninth hour went dark. Luke says it's like the sun was extinguished, like it went out. 
And here's Jesus on the cross. And so we're always raised to believe that Jesus took upon himself all the sin of all mankind of all time. It's more than that. See, if Jesus had taken upon himself the sin of all mankind, that means he would still have some righteousness within him, but he didn't. That darkness was because God and the Holy Spirit had to withdraw from him. And they had to withdraw from this place because they had to withdraw from him his righteousness and his holiness that he had known for all eternity with God. And now it's withdrawn from him. And so here he is on the cross in absolute anguish. There are those who will say that the Bible contradicts itself because John says that Jesus cried out with a loud voice and then said, it's finished. And Luke says he cried out in a loud voice and said, Father, into your spirit I commit, or into your hands I commit my spirit and gave up the ghost. And so they'll say, which is it? It contradicts itself. I say, yes. So Matthew and Mark both say that Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, imagine this. Christ, who knew nothing but the holiness and the righteousness of God, is now without it. And he has to be without it because of this. Paul tells us, for our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's a side note. Anywhere it says might, it's not contingent upon what God is doing. It's contingent upon us accepting what God's already done. If we accept that Jesus died for us and became sin for us, then we get the righteousness of God. Here's Jesus who for 3,000 years knew nothing, or for all of eternity, knew nothing but the righteousness of God, and now it's stripped from him. And so he cries out, Dad, where are you? I need you. I am lost without you. I am broken without you. I hurt so deeply. The Bible says that he cried out, I'm thirsty. This was to fulfill prophecy. But it's also because he was so dehydrated. They had jars of, of sour wine. It's what the Roman soldiers would drink to get drunk. And so they soaked a sponge in that, but they also covered it with myrrh, which was bitter. They, it was a kind of a, a weak attempt at being compassionate to him. It was an effort to give him alcohol that would get him drunk. It would also dehydrate him to speed up the process but the myrrh would bring him a little bit of calming effect. When it touched his lips, it says that Jesus rejected it and pushed it away. He had to, because he had to suffer everything for us in order that we might have all of his righteousness. If he didn't suffer everything for us, all of his righteousness would not be available to us. It's there at that point that Jesus then says, Dad, I'm done. I am so broken without you. I can't do this anymore. I'm finished. And that's when he gave up the ghost, and he died of a broken heart spiritually. This is why John records for us, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That might, again, is not contingent upon what God is doing, but whether we accept what God has already done. This is why Jesus looked at the disciples at the Last Supper. He tore that bread and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when he grabbed that wine, he said, this is my blood which is poured out for you, not dripped or drizzled, poured out every last drop for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What he was saying was, never forget this beautiful gift I've just given you. Never forget it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the amazing gift of your son. God, I thank you for the sacrifice. Father, that you had to remove yourself from him just so that we could be closer to you. Thank you, God, for your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.
continue to sing, we invite you to stand and join us.
We thank you that you love us so much that you're willing to send your son to die on a cross for us. Father, we ask that you would be with Larry as he comes this morning and brings a word. Father, you'd open our hearts, our minds to what you have to say to us through him. Uh, Father, we thank you that um, that we get to come to this place in freedom and, and to serve and to, to love and to sing and, Father, to worship you freely. Father, again, all the glory, all the honor, all the praise to you and to you alone, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Happy almost New Year. I pray that you had a fantastic Christmas, and I pray that uh, you got to be with your families, and that you ate a lot, and had to undo your belt, and uh, uh, I pray that you laughed a lot and played games and all those games that you've never seen before you got for Christmas. I think sometimes some of my family got it last Christmas and then they wanted to give it to us this Christmas because they never played it all year. But it's, it's fun. We had our second son and our fourth son. Our fourth son is uh, Terry Leatherman. He's one of the ministers at Clifton. And our second son is active duty Air Force a chaplain. Our uh, third son is a missionary in Cambodia, and our uh, oldest son is a chaplain in the army. See what God and a good mother can do? It's, uh, it, is, it is neat. I'm happy to be here. I'm thankful that Seth asked me to come. You know, uh, we did all those things, but also I imagine some of you did like we have at Clifton, there's some pain this last year in 2017. Some of you probably had surgery or some diseases or you lost loved ones. In fact, this very week at Clifton, we've already had two funerals and we will have a funeral uh, Saturday for a young lady around 30 years old and the mother of three children. She went to be with the Lord and her husband uh, has to raise those three kids now. There's pain at 
and especially any time of the year, but especially right now with things, or with uh, Christmas. But I want to challenge you to do some things this week, and uh, there's be about five challenges, and they only take an hour each as I develop them, and that's okay, isn't it? You, got, you brought your lunch? Uh, <clears throat> I, I hope you did, and I hope you invite me to eat with you. No, the, that's... That's not it. But I do want to talk to you about some things, about some commitments, and uh, they're all very simple commitments, but sometimes they're very hard to do because of the complexity of us and us not wanting or whatever to do. And the first one is very, very, very simple, you know. Uh, but uh, before, how many of your diets lasted beyond January of this year? How many of you kept going to the gym? You know, I, I, I think I'm going to make a couple of um, uh, New Year's resolutions, and then we'll talk about the commitments. I think I'm going to eat more and exercise less. I, I can do that one. You know, I, I think I'm going to put my feet up in my lazy boy chair another half an hour to an hour longer each day. Those are things I can do. You know what? And I would continue those. But, of course, my waistline's going to get bigger and my lifeline's going to get shorter if I do those kinds of things. But, anyhow, now one of the things that it's very simple to do, how many of you take yourself too seriously? How many of you didn't laugh enough in 2017? I want to challenge you in 2018, one of the commitments, I want you to, I want you to commit to laugh. I want you to commit to commit. To, to just have belly laughs and, and to smile and to enjoy life and not be so serious. You say, well, my job is serious. So what? Laugh a little. You see, is that what they want on your epitaph? I didn't laugh because I worked too much? You see, I want you to laugh more. And I believe God does. I, he, he, look at his face. God's got to have a sense of humor, you know. And I hope you, you, you do that. Uh, but I, uh, I want you to smile right now at the end of this year and uh, to begin next year. Uh, how many of you uh, have warning, seen the warning labels on things when you buy them? You know, especially medicines now. The warning labels are that long. And, and, but anyhow, I got a kick out of these, and I thought maybe you guys would. The Michigan Lawsuit Abuse Watch. Isn't that a mouthful? The Michigan Lawsuit Abuse Watch sponsors an annual contest of the most absurd warning labels put on products last year. It says number one is, do not use this snowblower on the roof. <laughs> number two, do not allow children to play in the dishwasher. A clothes iron ad says, warning, never iron clothes while they're being worn. Uh, Superman contest, on, and my wife did this one because I'm Superman, says, warning, cape does not enable user to fly. <laughs> uh, uh, on a bottle of women's hair color, and it says this, do not use as an ice cream topping. <laughs> uh, on, on a cardboard, uh, the shield that you put in the windshield, it says, do not drive with sun shield in place. Uh, a couple more. Uh, on a portable stroller, it says, caution, remove infant before storing stroller. Well, anyhow, you know, doesn't it seem obvious to all of us that we shouldn't use those products that way? But you see, somebody did, somebody was foolish, so they have to be warned against. You have to warn your, or prepare to warn yourself against the nut the one who's very foolish. Warning labels tell us about the obvious, doesn't it? One person once said this, the desire to make something foolproof vastly underestimates the creativity of fools. Uh, and so uh, when, you, when you do that, uh, you've got to know that somebody did it. But I hope you laughed, and I want you to keep on laughing. But the Bible also always states the obvious uh, because people are foolish. I'm foolish, you're foolish. And uh, uh, the scriptures, however, state the obvious and God repeats it 
numerous times throughout the scriptures. So uh, I want to uh, I want to encourage you to follow in, in, in number two, three, four, and five as I go through them. Number one, I want you to laugh more in 2018. Commit yourself to do that. Commit yourself to not take everything so seriously, no matter what kind of personality type you are. Number two, I want you to commit if you're taking notes, and I used to be at the college, and it's all students always used to take notes. Commit yourself to forget your failures. Commit yourself to forget your failures. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote this in Philippians. He said, forgetting what is behind and stretching forth toward which lies ahead, I press on toward the goal which, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's good advice. That's 2,000 years of advice that is very practical and applicable. It's, it is relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. It'll be relevant in one more day in 2018. God's saying here, you should not live your life imprisoned by your past. Look at our country today. There's so much going on because People want to draw people back to the past instead of living now and looking ahead and reaching toward the goals that which God's called us. Why are you still living? I don't believe you're living to go to a job. I don't believe you're living to make money. I don't believe you're living to do anything that our culture says we should be doing. I believe you're still living as Christians to get the message of Jesus Christ out to a lost and dying world. This isn't the mission field. The mission field is out there. And I believe God has still given you and me breath to go out and do that because he wants heaven populated and we must do it. And you see, if you're dwelling on your past failures, what you can't do, what you shouldn't do, what you did do, you'll never reach outward and upward You'll stay inward and want to hide your head in the sand and say, woe is me. We'll become victims. You see, all of us has failed in some way. In fact, what was a few years ago, the Detroit Lions football team lost every game, all 16 games. This year, this year, the Cleveland Browns have lost all of their games thus far. Of course, if they played the Denver Broncos, they might change that. Uh, Sorry about that, folks, you know. Uh, but most of us, most of us will never see our failures recorded on TV or the big screen, but they are recorded in our hearts and minds. And that's what I want to talk to you. Many of the things that's in your past are painful, you know. Maybe a failed relationship or a number of them. Maybe some wrong decisions. I'm good at buying high and selling low. I'm good at finding the slowest line in the supermarket. How about you guys? There's a lot of things I'm good at that I'm failing. But you see, many of us have failed and won't let go of it. We have every one of us in this room. I've never preached over 50 years now where there's not somebody in the audience that hasn't failed at something. But what God's word is saying here, do not allow yourself to be bogged down by past failures. Do not dwell on the past. So learn from it, yes. But do not dwell on it that keeps us from moving forward. And Satan loves to shoot fiery darts in our minds and saying, you're no good. You're not as beautiful or as handsome or as rich or have the body that somebody else does. You don't have the creativity like somebody. Satan loves that. And you, you'll fail again. God's calling us out of that and upward and outward. You see, if we dwell upon the past, it stops us from moving forward in the future that God has planned for you. Not, your, not what you have planned for you what God has planned for you, and with what God has planned for you, and you're doing it, you will succeed in his eyes, maybe not in the eyes of the world. Does that make sense? You see, who are you, to whom are you serving? Uh, I want to challenge you 
in 2018. Rise to the challenge to say to yourself, I'm going to, with the help of God, not let my past control me. I'm going to stop torturing myself about what I did or didn't do. It's a good time now to, to stop chaining ourselves to the past. God's saying in his, word, in his word, he doesn't want you to go through life branding yourself as a failure and being a victim. Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive you for all that. But you see, you need to forgive yourself. God's forgiven you. Have you forgiven yourself? If you do both, you'll start. So what a good, good way to start 2018. Number three, if you're taking notes, commit yourself to give up your grudges. I was talking to a doctor friend this last week, and he says, Larry, you would be amazed at the people who hold grudges that I hear about as a doctor. He says, it's amazing, and it's destroying them. It says, I want you to listen to these words in Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive each other whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. God is challenging you and me right here directly and personally to give up grudges. That's what he means when he says forgive each other the grievances you may have against one another. Let me explain what a grudge is. <clears throat> a grudge is a deep, ongoing resentment that we cultivate in our hearts. We cultivate it against someone else. A grudge is an unforgiving spirit that leads us to unforgiving attitudes and unforgiving actions. I, I, I believe after 50 or so years in the ministry, I... I I have some expertise that I wish I didn't have. Grudges are destructive. They're dangerous. They destroy marriages. They break up families. They ruin friendships. They split churches. A lot of churches have been split by Christians who call themselves Christians by grudges. Churches get split. You see, we need to be honest enough to admit that one of the scandals of the church is people hold things against one another. And it's amazing to me, I wonder who's going to be in heaven. There's not going to be a grudge, grudge people in heaven. Do you think there are? Not unforgiven grudge anyhow. You see, I want you to all be there. And I want to be there. But we must not hold grudges against one another. God says, Give it up. Uh, I'd like to also remind you that grudges are not just destructive. They are self-destructive. When you hold a grudge against someone, you're going to get hurt worse than they are. Okay? A few years ago, <clears throat> in the newspaper, an article uh, said there was a bomb sent to the parcel post, and the guy went out, and he got that package, took it in the house, opened it up, and it exploded and killed him. Well, that's bad. What was seemingly unconnected was that two weeks later, there was a couple in another town that committed suicide. That couple had sent that bomb because that guy had they were holding a grudge against that guy for something that guy did when they were back in grade school. True story. Grudges destroy. Uh, Job says in chapter 21, have no happiness at all those who live and die with bitter hearts. Folks, do not let bitterness rent space in your mind. Do not let bitterness rent space in your mind. Don't even let it come in there. Don't hold grudges. Is that what you want on your epitaph, that I held grudges? Max Lucado in his book says this. He said, an unforgiving servant always ends up in prison. Prisons of anger, prisons of guilt, and prisons of depression. And those are things that send us to the hospital, 
and ultimately send us to an early grave. God says in his word, don't sentence yourself to prison that way. Let it go. Let it go. I've, I, I, I've preached many sermons and been in literally thousands of churches. And there are Christians who are still holding grudges against people. Let it go and forgive. Now, God isn't asking you uh, to pretend what they did didn't happen. That's not what he's asking you. He's not asking you to ignore whatever that person has done to you. He doesn't ask you to condone it. Not to pretend it doesn't matter. What God asks us to do is to forgive. To, that means to acknowledge how wrong and painful what was done to you, but to decide it's a decision. Love is a decision. Forgiveness is a decision to forgive the person who did the wrong to you. You see, God says, until you forgive, I won't forgive you. And that's tough sometimes. And you know what? I've even had to tell people to go out to a cemetery to where that person that hurt them so bad and forgive them there at the cemetery. Don't hold grudges. And if you don't do that in 2018, you're going to be able to smile more. It's going to be a better year because you're not a victim to them. Okay, let's move on. Wow, this isn't taking as long as I thought. Maybe I ought to add more. If you've got more stuff I can add. Uh, number four, commit yourself this year in 2018 to restore relationships. Many times when I turn on my computer, there's a little thing that's flashing up here and it asks if I want to check to see if all my software is working properly. And many times it's not, and I'm not a technocrat, but uh, my boys are, but I'm not. But God uses that same kind of invitation. He says, it's not the invitation to check out your computer software, but it's an invitation to check out your personal software. Here's how the Lord issues this challenge for you and me in 2018 out of Romans 12, 18, if you're taking notes. If, it's, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at what? Peace with everyone. That's God saying that. Commit yourself to restore relationships. The, the operative phrase here, as far as it depends on you and me. God's using that phrase by personally challenging each one of us to do whatever we can to restore a relationship and restore our own relationship with God back to where there's, the, that should be the default relationship. Always going back to a right relationship with God. That's always primary. Us as well as them. You know, some relationships have gone wrong in your life because of what they've done. And you can't control what they've done. And all the marriage counseling I've done, you cannot control what your husband or wife's doing. You can only control what you're doing or should be doing. God recognizes that. But that's why he starts it with, if it's possible. But some of our relationships have gone wrong not because of what they have done, because of what we have done. We did it. Again, be honest with ourselves. What, what God's saying here is as far as it depends on you, live with everyone is saying if there's been a rift in a relationship, then you have a responsibility to restore it as a Christian. Not because you're an American. Not because you're... Uh, a human uh, walking on this terra firma. You're a glob of protoplasm walking on the terra firma. No, because you're a Christian. Because you're a Christian. Uh, it's difficult at times. A few years ago, there was a song or, and, and a book and a, and a movie called Never Say I'm Sorry. That's one of the most absurd statements I've ever heard. We need to say I'm sorry. 
because we all flub up. My wife's in here in the early service, and she jumped up and said, Hallelujah! No, uh, she's not here, so I told her to go home. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it's easy sometimes when a stranger or an acquaintance does something or you do something to, to say I'm sorry. But sometimes it's hard to a Christian brother or sister or to a husband or wife or to children or to your parents to say, I'm sorry. When are we still in relationships? Those words ought to be in your vocabulary and in mine also. How many marriages could be turned around or could have been turned around? You know, harsh words and cutting words have wounded people throughout the century. 2018, let's not do that. Will you commit to not do that? Because let's make relationships restore. God is saying in 2018, I believe, that you are sorry for unselfish, unkind, temperamental relationships. And I'm going to change it if it's in my power. Seek forgiveness and give it. Now, number five. Aren't you happy I'm, ready? I'm already on number five? See, that didn't take long. You see, I've only been preaching 15 minutes. The reason I know I'm 15, count, look at your watch right now and count back 15 minutes. That's when I started. Commit yourself, in number five, to turn, back, turn your back on your transgressions. Let me explain what I'm talking about. There was a book about the Civil War. After the Civil War was over, it was said that, well, the fr the, they were free. The slaves were free. They, they were free then. They should have been freed for. They should have never been slaves in the first place. But let, we'll not get into that. But a lot of the slaves, all the slaves were set free by that proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation. But many thousands of those slaves, even though they were free, went back and lived and worked with the same people that lived and worked before they were free. You see, that's what they knew. That's what they lived with before. That's all they knew. Even though they had freedom and they didn't understand it, they went back to the old way. How many of you have seen people who have confessed Christ, repented of their sins, been baptized, then you see received the gift of the Holy Spirit, as it says in Acts 2.38, very first sermon ever preached in the history of the church. They wouldn't mess it up. And they've got the freedom in Christ. They're no longer slaves to sin. But after two, three, four months, what do they go back to? Instead of living by faith and freedom, they want to go back to where they were, even though it was bad, even though they were chained by it, even though they were imprisoned by it, they would go back rather than to go ahead and live by faith and obedience. You know people that way? I met many of them. And it's sad. Romans 6 says this. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to its lustful desires. We are no longer slaves to sin. This is the last challenge I want to give you this morning. I want you to meet it. Do not let sin control your life. And go back to what you used to be a part of. Turn your back on those transgressions. One of the things that it talks about in Hebrews, it talks about besetting sins. Do you know what I'm talking about, besetting sins? When we, were, when we became Christians, there were certain sins that it was easy to forget, to let go of, to not, it didn't control us. But every one of us in here, everyone, has sins that are besetting. You see, those are the sins that are down deep in us that if we don't watch out, we'll go back and do over and over and over again. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't want to know your sins. But you know what I'm talking about? Those are besetting sins. Maybe your husband and wife don't know about them. 
Your children, your parents don't know about them, but you know about them, and God knows about them. Whatever they are. And many of us give up to our besetting sins rather than living the new life in Christ. Because those besetting sins have been there so long and they're so easy to get back into. They're comfortable almost. Don't do that in 2018. I t- used to take a magazine when I was full-time in the ministry. Now I'm kind of just semi-retarded. I mean retired. Uh, and and uh, it was called Leadership Magazine. And in this magazine, an anonymous minister wrote that his besetting sin was pornography. And he was overcome by guilt every time he did it. Lord, I'll never do it again. Lord, I'll never do it again. And he did it again. Lord, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. But he did it again. And his besetting sin kept overcoming him. Folks, I don't know what yours is. But I don't want your past transgressions to control the freedom and joy that we have in Jesus Christ. There's joy in Christ, isn't there? And we we don't want those things that are in our past. And don't you dare, if you know someone else is besetting sins, go talk about it to them because all it does is bring them up and make them feel guilty. Let Let me give you an idea how to get rid of those things. This young man finally came to the realization, the only way I'm going to get rid of this besetting sin, because I pray about it all the time, I think about it, and every time I pray about it, it comes up again. And it became a mountain. And a mountain, and we're used to mountains, you get real close to the mountain, what happens? You can't see around it, you can't see through it, you can't see over it, you can't see under it. It's that close. That's like a besetting sin. Do you know what he learned to do? He started finally looking up to the mountain mover. And as he got closer to the mountain mover, what happened to the mountain? It started receding and became smaller and smaller and smaller. God's word and a personal relationship. And he stopped praying about the besetting son, sin and he got praying to Jesus, help me to be more like you. Help me to have a mind like you. Help me to follow and it made him study the word more, and he got closer to Jesus, and the sin got less and less. Does that make sense? I don't know where you're at, but I want you to have 2018 to be a fantastic year. God challenges us here in these five things to do that. Will you let and forget past failures? Will you commit yourself to give up your grudges? Will you commit to turning yourself on your back of your, to your transgressions? Will you forget? We're going to offer a hymn of invitation. Uh, but I, before I do that, I want you to give you one smile again. One more uh, warning label that was there was... When you get <coughs> the, the nuke machine, you know, we nuke, boop, 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 and nuke our, our stuff, the microwave. A warning label on that microwave was, don't dry your pets in the microwave. <laughs> I want to leave you with a smile. <laughs> Folks, God bless you. Thank you for letting me preach. I love preaching God's words, and I love his people, and you are his people. But I would be remiss in my mind. Probably most of you here are Christians. But there may be one that's not. And the greatest thing you can do in 2018 is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. No other decision is greater. Zero decisions in this life is greater than that. When you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord... And repent of your sins, again, second chapter of Acts. And then you're baptized, the washing away of those sins. And then it says, the, comes the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the ecclesia, the paraclete, the one who walks beside and in. 
and you come out of that a new creature, clean and pure and sinless at that time. May you have a fantastic 2018, folks, and uh, may God use you, let him use you in your imperfections. Don't dwell upon those imperfections. Dwell upon what God has allowed you to be and will allow you to become. Being is important, more important than doing. Being first and then go do. May you have a fantastic 2018. It's yours. Hey, I appreciate these folks doing their music. It was good this morning. Give them a hand, would you? <laughs> God bless. God bless. Happy New Year. Well, we, uh, we certainly hope you're blessed by uh, Larry's message this morning. And, and seriously, if you uh, have any things that go on in your life, we know that through, through a year, uh, there's lots of things that happen. Uh, some good, some bad. Um, and almost anything that we deal with in this world, we can give up to Jesus. Uh, and he will help us through anything. And so uh, if you have things that are going on in your heart, your mind, your life uh, that you need prayer for, uh, you need to talk about, please come uh, come and talk to us when we're done with service. And we'd, we'd love to pray with you and, and those things. Why don't you stand with us as we close together with a song. I once was dead in sin, alone and homeless. As a child of wrath, I walked condemned in darkness. But your mercy brought me life, and in your loving kindness, raised me up with Christ. You have fun.